Good evening, everyone. I am Pastor Sigmund from Brian Bible Church, Grace Life Church. We are have a program here called Grace Life Unleashed, and our PO box is Box 6033 in Evansville, Indiana, 47719. If you'd like to send a, a gift to further ministry and continue to ministry, this is where you need to send it. We are currently meeting, and uh, we love it, at the YMCA in downtown Evansville. It's a perfect location for a church. We're kind of the church of the Y. Um, this is my phone number if you want to send me a text or, or something like that. Um, good stuff is happening. If you want to look at some of our past videos or find out more about us, our website is gracelifeunleashed.com. YouTube is Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund. And if you get on here, please um, subscribe. Uh, like it if you want. If you click on the little alarm bell that's on there, um, it'll send you a notification every time I put a new video up, which is twice a week. Uh, Facebook is Grace Life Church and Brian Bible Church, and all really that does is links you back to YouTube. We dump everything on YouTube and then link from it from our website and Facebook, and I have an account on Rumble also if you want to. It's basically another YouTube-type channel. What we are seeing in Romans... I think is the, where we're at now in Romans 6. Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 are, are probably the most practical books, more so um, 7 and 8, maybe even 6 too. But I mean, the point is, th this is where Paul now starts to put a grace believer back together again, but using grace. And, and a lot of grace people never took themselves apart and got rid of the law in their life and they're a mess. Uh, really, I, I meet very few content grace people. And then that bothers me. Now, I do meet some, so I'm not saying you know, all of you guys are. I meet very few content because they, they are constantly in frustration because they don't like something going on either in their life or the life of others. And, and once you understand how grace operates, it should free you from these kind of things. About um. It's hard to see here. It says grace in action. I don't know if you can see that. I guess that's a little bit of a dark slide. Um, about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, um, I was frustrated with the results that I was seeing in, in my people in my church in, in, in Orlando and, and just even in my own life about uh, the ability to minister to others. And I'm not talking about ministering to people in the church. I'm talking about ministering to people outside the church and I'm probably not even talking about Christians. I'm talking about the unsaved. Folks, we're ambassadors for Christ. And we've been asked to take this message of reconciliation to the world. The world is not going to come to our door and beat it down and ask us how to be saved. They're not going to. So we're going to have to go to them. But most Christians are, are angry at the unsaved people. They're, they're, they're mad at them. They don't like them. They're, they don't like what they're doing. And, and I don't blame them. I mean, I don't like what they're doing either. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them aren't. But because we have nothing in common with them, we, they don't even want to talk to us, and we don't want to talk to them. And so nobody gets talked to, and, and those folks are headed to the lake of fire, and we're going to heaven, praise the Lord, and we're not ministering to people. God's number one goal, and we talked about this on Sunday, if you go back and listen to my message from Sunday, you know, what's God's will? What does God want from me? Well, God's will is the same thing he wants from you. God's will is that all men be saved and then come to a knowledge of the truth. And, and the question is, well, who's going to do that? Whose job is it? to take the message of salvation, to take the message of reconciliation, to take the salvation message to the world. Who's doing it? Well, that's the pastor's job. That, that's true, it is. But really, in, in, in total honesty, it's all of our jobs. God has asked all of us to take this message to the world. So how are we going to do that if, number one, we don't like these people, which comes across very clearly um, when we talk to them, our body language is terrible. Number two, we don't want to be around them, which is pretty obvious. And, and number three, they don't want to be around us. And so nothing's getting done. So I, I decided I'm, I'm going to have to learn how to talk to these people. I'm going to have to learn how to, how to tolerate them and 
become their friend and then I decided I can't go in there with you know both horns out you know and, and, and just plow them over I have to become their friend first before I can actually lead them to Christ and I I, I put myself in a position to where I actively tried to do this now the first thing that will happen if you decide you want to be someone's friend with, with and again with the sole purpose that, that they're saved. I, I guess that sounds a little bit naive, but um, that's probably what it was. With the sole purpose of having saved, are those people going to use me? Because we're asked to be Christ-like in our character. We're asked to be Christ-like in our actions. And, and Christ, as he walked the earth, people used him all the time. I mean, Christ let these people grab him and hang him on a cross because that's what he needed to do. And I always say, if you start helping people, you start being somebody's friend, not everyone's going to take advantage of that, but some people will. But how do you know the difference? Well, most Christians are like, I tried that once and didn't work, so I'm never going to do it again. And so now they never talk to unsaved people. They don't have any unsaved friends. They don't do anything with unsaved people. And they have no testimony within the world because they're not talking to anybody about Christ. I'm not sure that's the answer. I know that's their answer, but I don't think that's the answer. And and I've said before, and, and a lady sent me a song the other day um, about getting your hands dirty. Um, we've got to get into the mud where they are. That's where they hang out. It's not that much fun, actually, but we have to go down to their level. They're not coming up to ours. We've got to go down to them. And we have to be willing to do that. And I'll guarantee you, you'll be used. I, I will guarantee you'll be used. But do you think Christ ever looked at how things went here on earth and went, those people used me every single day. So if we're asked to be Christ-like in our actions, Christ-like in our character, we're going to have to tolerate the, the, the bad and the ugly to get the good. And, and there are going to be people out, people out there that want you to use you, that have a legitimate desire and need that you're willing to help. But I can't tell you who those people are until you get in the, into the mud with them. And people say, well, then don't, don't even do it because I don't want you to do that. I'll guarantee you the results you get if you hang in there, because you'll get bad results, and you'll get mediocre results, and you'll get no results, but you'll get some good results. And that good results is kind of what will make the bad results, I guess, worth it, and you'll be content. But you got to learn not to take things personal. You have to learn not to be so thin-skinned and, and, and say, you know, that... And again, it hurts. I always say, you know, sticks and stones may, may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Trust me, words hurt worse sometimes than, than sticks and stones do. Especially when people don't understand your motives and what you're up to. I, I've worked with people... I worked with a um, young man, anybody under... 50s now young this guy was in his 30s I, I worked with him for three years helping him out just being his friend I helped him remodel his kitchen and things like that did a few things for him three years and now he's saved I, I there were times when I was like this guy's never going to come around he, he just did not care at all about Christianity. He didn't care about Jesus Christ. He didn't care about the Bible. He didn't care about any of that stuff. And, and all of a sudden, one day, it went, clicked. And I didn't preach at him every time I was over there helping and being his friend. I, I, no, I just would come up in a general conversation. And all of a sudden, it clicked. And those are the things, you know, I, and I look at them and I go, wow, that, that, that praise the Lord for that. Because he wasn't saved three years ago, and now he is. And, and he's got a long way to go, I realize that. But he's saved. And I, and I can name other people that I've been involved in lives. And guess what? I can name more people that I've failed at this than actually success stories. And like, well, that's, that's not very good odds there, Pastor Dave. I'd like to see like an 80% success rate here. Well, let me tell you something. If you're not doing anything, your success rate is zero. 
at least I got a, you know, 20%, 30% success rate. And um, I'm living the grace life. And, and as much as, as maybe some people don't understand that, I'm content. God's working in me. God's working through me. God is getting things done through the body of Christ, through me. And yeah, um, there are times when I'm like, Man, this, this hurts. And then I, I sit back and I'm like, Lord, I'm complaining to you that this hurts. When you came down as a man and let these people crucify you and and be mean to you and, and it beat you up and, and I'm complaining it hurts. You see, everything's in perspective. So so enjoy the ride, enjoy the enjoy the grace life, but don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. We can wash them, okay? Because that's where the action takes place. It's not taking place in our, our little sterilized homes that, that no one's allowed in. That be, and again, I, I love sterilized homes where no one's allowed in and we're protected, especially for kids. But that's not where salvation is taking place. And granted, I, my kids are all saved. And I made sure they were saved. And, and I, I totally am on board. Praise the Lord for my family. But now we can move on, you know and help others. We, we are here for others. We're not here for ourselves. If we were here for ourselves, God would take us home. We're here for others. So th this is grace in action, okay? Now we're in Romans 6, and we go back and listen to you know Romans 1 through, 1 through 13 from last week. Um, you know, Paul asks us a really good question. You know, now that we understand how grace works, there, there, once we're saved, there is nothing we can do to lose our salvation. But what Paul said last week was that doesn't mean we should go around abusing grace. Well, Paul's going to kind of say the same thing again today. I, I love how Paul looks at things from like five different perspectives. This is another perspective. For sin shall not have dominion over you, um, because you're not under the law. Now, the thing about it is, once you are saved, the old man is crucified, the old man is dead, the old man is gone, the new man lives, but because of habit... Because of lifestyle, because of friends, because of lack of spiritual maturity, and because we've been doing this our whole life, we, even though the old man's dead, we're continuing to live in the old man. Because normal is what normal knows. But what salvation does, and, and you've got to comprehend this, salvation allows you now to not sin. It's, it's almost like you were under the power of the old man before, and you couldn't say no. Now you have the ability to say no and make choices. It's there. But you got to grasp that, okay? And, and um, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? And again, where there is no law, there is no sin. But there's still common sense, okay? Uh, you know, there, there's still, in a sense, sin. But God's not counting it against you, okay? Uh, but under grace, and God, Paul says the same thing he always says, God forbid, which is like, what? Why would you go there? Why, why are you going to go there? And that's because that's where we always go. That's like when you step out and you decide, I am going to be a friend to somebody in need. Is there a potential that that friend in need is going to abuse your friendship and, in a sense, take you to the cleaners or just continue to suck the life out of you and not really understand why you're doing what you're doing? Of course there is. That's exactly what grace does. Do you, do you think for a moment that we've never abused grace? Do you think for a moment that we never said, you know what, I've been forgiven, I think I'm going to go do this anyways? We, we all have been there. Shame on us, we've all been there. That's why Paul's answer is, all right, kitty cat, off you go. Paul's answer is, God forbid. Like, why, why do you want to go there? Don't go there. But yeah, you could go there, but we're not going to go there, okay? No, ye not. That to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants, ye are to whom you obey. You can choose to yield your body to the old man, even though he's dead. Just go back to the way you're doing things. Or you can choose, you know, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. You can choose. Again, this is choices thing. And, and sometimes choices are really difficult because they're choices. You know, it's kind of like, I don't want to make a choice. Well, before you were saved, in a sense, you didn't really have to make choices. Now, after you're saved, you have the ability to make choices because you have the ability to conquer sin. And that's what makes grace exciting, is you have the ability now to win. But you got to want to, okay? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Now, 
Again, for a lot of people, even though they, they were, they still are. Does that make any sense? You know, they, they haven't changed anything in their life. They'll still, they'll still, they're still serving sin, but they don't realize is they've been freed from that sin. It's kind of like if, if, if you're a slave and the owner walks in and says, guys, you're all free, and you're like, eh, I kind of like you. I'm going to continue to be your slave. Uh, okay, fine. But don't complain to me when the owner tells you what to do. Well, I don't want to be out in that world. That world's scary. I'd rather have somebody tell me what to do. Well, okay. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Again, you have the ability to now choose and choose the right path. It's choices. You know, and, and, and I wish God would take away that old way. And I really believe in the new covenant he's going to he's going to change their hearts but for us we've now been freed and we're free to make correct choices but a lot of people don't want to make those choices or are unwilling to or don't even realize it that they're they are free now to live the grace life be then made free from sin you become the servants of righteousness now for a lot of people the problem is they don't understand any of this you know they don't realize it they don't realize that they now are free because they've always lived this way and all of a sudden now they're saved and, and they just continue doing the things the way they used to do them. You, have, you now have the ability to, basically you're free to, to leave, to choose to live another life, to choose to make better decisions. You have to want to do it though. God's not going to make you. I want him to. God's not going to make you. It's, it's free will. It's grace. You have to want to. And what I do with a lot of people is, you know, they'll, they'll crash and burn, and that's the problem with people who are living a life of sin. They crash and burn, and then they, you know, complain now. They hate their life, and they complain about the bad choices they make. And I, and I look at them, and I go, don't make those choices then. Just stop doing it. All right, I will. You know, in that last couple of days, couple of weeks, a couple of months, and all of a sudden they make bad choices. But hopefully over time, as they grow in Christ, the bad choices become less and less, and they start to, to continue to grow in Christ. And, and that's called maturity. Um, but what a lot of people do is they give up on them or don't even want to go there because, tell you what, you know, childhood ignorance exists in grace people as they are growing in Christ. They're, they're going to make mistakes just because they don't understand everything. And, and it's not our job to kill the wounded. It's not our job to, to take them out. It's our job to encourage them, to, to uplift them. And, and I believe in second chances, and I believe in third chances, and unfortunately I believe in a hundred chances. If their heart's right, I will continue to believe in them because God believes in them and all of us, okay? We're now living the righteous life, I guess you could say. I speak after manner of men because of the infirmities of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto righteousness. And again, well, what, all these words are like, decide where you want to live. Decide how you want to live. And, and probably if you decide you want to live the righteousness, probably the easiest thing to do is to stay away from some of your bad friends. Stay away from some of those bad decisions. Keep yourself busy doing something else so that you don't have time for those things. And a lot of that stuff takes care of itself. And, uh, you know, it, it just makes sense. You know, going to church does not fix you, but going to church means you're not anyplace else. That's what I always tell people, you know. It's not magic in church, but I know where you are then. Hey, whatever it takes. Find some people that you like hanging around with that have some good values and do things with them. And you'll find that, that things will go better in your life. And then, you know, as you learn to undo some of these bad habits, eventually you'll start growing and growing and growing in Christ, and then things will be so much better. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Again, when you were unsaved, you didn't have the ability to live the righteous life. You were a servant to sin. And, and you know, normal is what normal knows. And after you're saved, normal still thinks that that's what's going on. In reality, no, you've been free. Now you don't have to do that anymore. What fruit have ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? You know, why are you still doing those things if you know it's bad? Why are you doing those things when you know it's not healthy? Why are you doing these things when, when you know it's probably not good for you in the long term? Why are you doing these things? Well, I, I'm on autopilot. 
It's the way I've always done it. Maybe it's time to make some decisions. And sometimes decisions are hard. And sometimes people don't make decisions until, you know, it's too late. And sometimes people don't make decisions until the consequences are more than they can understand. Or the end of those things is death. You know, again, the, the world is going down a certain way, and the world does not even realize that they're headed to the lake of fire. They are the ones that we're supposed to work with, and we need to talk to these people. But now being made free from sin. Okay, at the moment of salvation, you're made free from sin. It doesn't mean you're not sinning, but it means you have the ability to not sin. Okay? And become servants of God. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You know, we, we know we're going to heaven. We know in God's sight we're declared holy, and righteous, and unblameable, and justified, and sanctified, and all those words. That's how God sees us. And it's a matter of now just getting our act together and start living a life like that. Not because God's anti-fun. God is anti-trouble. You know that? I, I don't know why so many people love drama in their life. What is so much fun about drama? And controversy and chaos. I kind of like boring nothingness. Isn't that kind of nice? Maybe you like chaos, I don't know. And again, reality is the wages of sin is death. You know, the world is going to reap what it sows. Unsaved people are headed to the lake of fire because of lack of good works, okay? Christ died on the cross for their sins. And they're going to stand before God and they're going to have hopefully enough good works to get them saved, but they won't. What they need is God's righteousness. They need the righteousness of God placed on them. And at the moment of salvation, God places his righteousness on us. And we are declared just as righteous as Jesus Christ himself, which is just as righteous as God is. That's how salvation works. Your salvation has nothing to do with us. We, we, there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. Now, after we're saved, God would like us to live a righteous life. And that's what Paul's been talking about here in these verses at the end of Romans chapter 6. But it's changing our attitude because the choices are pretty blatant. Sin or righteousness. You have a choice. Now, you know, it, it, this, can, can this get any easier? I don't think it can. It's just a matter of making right choices. And so as we, and probably the best thing to do is just to, to get involved with people who are maybe a little bit nicer, a little bit better, and get stay away from those things. And as we grow in Christ, a lot of that stuff will grow strangely dim, I guess you could say. But from a mature standpoint, I want to encourage the mature Christians, we're going to have to get down there and talk to these people that are, you know, basically living these lives. Because they're not going to come to us. But, but be careful, Okay. Be really careful, because um, it's dangerous. These people take prisoners, <laughs> okay? But in the same sense, not doing it, you'll have zero success. And that's not what God asked us, never asked us not to do anything. He didn't say, run away now and go hide and stay away from those unsaved people because they're bad. No, he said, you guys are now ambassadors, and you represent me to whom? to the body of Christ? Well, not really. We represent God to the lost world. Okay? We are supposed to take the message of reconciliation to the lost. They're not going to come to us. We have to go to them. So we've got to come up with a plan on how we're going to go to the world. And for some people, I don't know what that is. For some people, they've got a good plan. Some people, is they don't even want to deal with that plan. They want to run away from those people. And I think that's wrong. So well, let's leave today with that, you know. Are we engaged in evangelism or not? Are we engaged in talking to people who are lost or not? Are we engaged in people's lives because God has asked us to so that they can see salvation in us? And that takes more than one minute or two minutes or one day or two days. It can take years people to see the maturity you have in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we read these verses in Romans 6, Lord, we, we pray that we're the instruments of righteousness, that we're living the righteous life that you want us to live, and Lord, that we are taking this ministry of reconciliation to the lost and telling them about salvation. Lord, they need Christ crucified. 
And the only one who's going to take it to him is us. The body of Christ has been asked to take the message to the world. Lord, we pray we can be faithful servants. And we can talk to these folks. And that we don't get offended. We don't get mad. We don't get angry. We don't run away. We don't get hurt. We don't get frustrated. But we understand what the love of Christ is. The same love you showed us, Lord, when you died on the cross for our sins. We pray this in your name. Amen.